cute, yeah. Yeah, cute, great. Cute. Big Mouth strikes again, and again, and again, until every last remnant of your energy is completely beat out of you. That's not to say that the show is completely hopeless. There is enjoyment to be had here, but overall it wound up being a tired exercise in lazy writing. It's funny, but it's definitely more complicational, that's for sure. Yeah, it's like one person playing cards at just about everything that annoys me is present in the show. It almost seems specifically designed to contain every little thing I am averse to when it comes to animated entertainment. You know who's funny? The Big Bang Theory. Loud, obnoxious characters who scream all the time. Shut up, Matthew! Ah! <laughs> An American high school setting. Constant breaking of the fourth wall. Ah! Please tell me they put a Walgreens in this Netflix. Oh, hi there. Thanks for tuning in to this YouTube video that you are watching, and you probably already know the other thing that pretty much everyone is in agreement on when it comes to... Big Mouth. Seeing as Netflix has already renewed the show for a second season, I think now would be as good a time as any to point out some of the more egregious, hormone monstrous problems, so hopefully we can see an improvement for the second season. She's just like a minion. The initial reception to the trailers for this show were largely quite bad, because it admittedly did look pretty awful in more ways than one, everything seemed to be going against it until it officially released. Currently Big Mouth has a perfect 100 from 15 critics on Rotten Tomatoes, or Tomatoes, doesn't really matter, as well as an 80 from 6 critics on Metacritic. No sentence should have the word critic in it so many times. Overall pretty positive, you have to admit. Were those people hating on the original trailers just being reactionary? Or is the coverage on the show just too minimal to be conclusive on if it's good or not? Why don't you guys get champagne, it's free. <laughs> Well, I've sat through the show twice, twice, as well as more viewing time from editing this video, and I have to say, I do not like this show for a myriad of different reasons. I've never covered an entire season of a show before, so for simplicity's sake, I've split up my key points into sections. Let's begin with the first one. That's how numbers work. Big Mouth is a simple coming-of-age story about two or three main characters dealing with a confusing and complicated mess that is going through puberty while at high school. Our lovely, not totally ugly and disgusting protagonists are Nick, Andrew, Jesse, and I guess Jay? but he's more of a Kramer from Seinfeld type character who's mostly there just to make you laugh and giggle. Supposedly, certain events in the show were based on experiences that some of the voice and writing talent went through when they were kids themselves. A lot of the stories are based on <laughs> our childhood and our, our friends uh, when we were growing up. There isn't an overarching plot as much as there are mini stories for each episode that only loosely link together, such as how awkward it is getting your first period, figuring out which way you swing sexually, first relationships and breakups, that kind of thing. Minor seeds are planted in earlier episodes that have consequences in later ones, such as the boys stumbling across the annoying girl character's mother who turns out to be cheating on her husband, which comes to a head in a later episode to highlight how it's not just the kids who are having a difficult time. Some adults have no idea what they're doing either. Unfortunately, Big Mouth just doesn't know when to stop, almost entirely throwing any ounce of subtlety out the window, relying mostly on gross-out stories and humour of a suitably juvenile nature. And yes, I do realise that's kind of the point, but the problem for me is that it simply cannot figure out what kind of audience it wants to appeal to. When I was 13, coincidentally the same age as the main characters in the show, my parents gave me a book called living with a willy. It was effectively the book version of Big Mouth, but designed as more of a learning tool to explain and rationalise some of the strange changes and feelings you're going to go through as you start going through puberty. It was also full of plenty of humour because it's inherently a funny and awkward topic. Everyone has their own stories about these kind of experiences, so it makes it that much more relatable and humorous because we've all been there. Well, based on my analytics of who watched my videos, most of you will be there soon. Unfortunately, outside of the 13-year-old kids who are currently going through the same thing as the ones in the show, I don't really know who else this show is for because of how superficial the storytelling is. There are no greater themes you have to take a moment to think about that are even remotely interesting or new. There's nothing that satirical about the setting aside from a couple of examples. It's all simplistic enough for a 13-year-old to understand. In fact, this is the kind of thing I probably would have loved as a 13-year-old boy. It's edgy, out there, offensive, and rude, but 
I've already gone through everything in this show in my real life already, and that was awful enough on its own. Why would I want to be reminded of all that horrible, horrible torture if you're not going to put a clever spin on it? Big Mouth's idea of being clever is having a loud, obnoxious monster show up who can make intercourse jokes and be crude. I'm sure loads of 13 year olds absolutely love the hormone monster because it appeals so much to their 13 year old sensibilities, but in the end it only ends up being a huge missed opportunity. A teenager's hormones being personified into a physical monster for the characters to talk to is honestly brilliant. This idea if used properly could be really hilarious, and there are some decent scenes where they scratch the surface of what they could do with this, but more often than not they just fall back on the all too safe and predictable crude gross out stuff. Aside from the old thing I've mentioned, I'm sure a lot of this sounds fine. I think the setting's a brilliant one if you're wanting to tell awkward stories about growing up, but where it all falls apart for me, and where my biggest problems lie, are all down to the execution and how it's all played out. What are the rules? When I first saw the trailers with the hormone monster character, without even seeing the show, I just assumed that this monster was a manifestation in a single character's head. The character who is linked with the hormone monster is Andrew. It's his hormone monster. So I naturally thought only he could see it. Only he could interact with it. Go away. You are not real. You're just some hormone monster my brain created. And that technically the hormone monster doesn't actually exist, or at the very least is only visible to Andrew. It's the show's way of personifying the change we all go through, and it is a fun storytelling device, to have your hormones be a creature who can have dialogue and torment the character. However, all of my assumptions were wrong, because the hormone monster is not unique to Andrew. Randomly other people can start interacting with him when it's convenient to the script. There's a monster next to you. Hey, what's up, Caleb? This goes as far as to include conversations where the hormone monster just disappears between cuts. He has no presence in any scene because I just don't understand how he works. Other characters start referencing the same hormone monster as if he's their hormone monster too. Do you mean the hormone monster? Yeah. Mori. And later on in the show, Nick has to have an interview with the hormone monster to see if he qualifies for puberty yet. But then at the same time as all this, when Jessie starts going through changes, she gets the hormone monstress, who is a different character but plays the same role but for women. But then to make it even more confusing, a character called Coach Steve, who I cannot stand by the way, he's just too stupid for me. He has his own hormone monster, despite being a fully grown adult. Surely it'd be a lot more effective and creative if everyone had their own hormone monster that was tailored to their personality and desires. There would be so much potential for humor, and you can give the silly cartoon world a sense of internal logic that would ground the ridiculous humor a little bit. For a show that's supposed to be linking chronologically and telling a story with characters who are consistent throughout the series, you need rules to organize the chaos and absurdity to stop it from coming across as complete nonsense that appears to be completely random without a sense of direction or deliberate thought. For as absurd as shows like Rick and Morty, Bojack Horseman, or South Park can get, the purposeful nature of the absurdity sells you on the world, and makes even the most ridiculous thing just work and feel natural. This whole thing is actually a really difficult concept to describe because to me it seems like an unspoken rule you just automatically write into your material. I've never witnessed a show do something like this to quite this extent. Come on, come on, come on, get your asses. Thanks for standing in the way of Big Mouth Arc. Do you have anything to say about Big Mouth? Hi, you're looking at me. How tall Thanks. Are you? There's a monster next to you. Hey, what's up, Caleb? But so that kid that kid recognized him. That kid acknowledged the monster. So everyone can see him then. No. Why is no one doing anything? I just don't understand, it's really confusing. You can be as crazy and nonsensical as you like, but if you can't be bothered to establish the cause and effect of these wacky, strange and confusing elements, then why should I give you the benefit of the doubt and trust you if you don't think I'm intelligent enough to consider this kind of thing in your show I'm desperately trying to get into? I shouldn't have to do the work to find out how this world works and find it entertaining. It's literally your one job. And as if that's not bad enough, one episode begins with the backstory of how the hormone monster was born. That, of course, being the result of an alien creature coming down to prehistoric Earth and having intercourse with the planet itself. Meaning that the hormone monster... is, is an alien? Like... what?
What a bizarre and unfunny way to ruin and make such a good concept so contrived. There are smarter ways to make fun of Scientology. Honestly, if it was just the three hormone monsters who did this, I wouldn't really care that much. But these preposterous rules you're just supposed to ignore just keep stacking on top of each other. Early on in the show, it's established that Jay does nasty things to his pillow. Okay, that's fine. That's the kind of gross thing teenagers do. Makes sense. But then a few episodes later, it's revealed that this pillow is in fact pregnant with his human pillow hybrid child. I'm pregnant. What? <laughs> nice. I mean, how would that even be possible? Come on, don't be naive, Jay. I told you to use protection. What? For the entire episode, I was waiting for it to be revealed that it was all a dream, or he was high or something. But no. There's straight up an episode where a 13-year-old boy gets a pillow pregnant. They even call back to it in the last episode. Who are these pillows? We are his family. So like, that's a thing that can happen in this universe, I guess? Is this one of the stories that's based on Nick Kroll's childhood experiences? <laughs> like, is this the only way you could make humping a pillow funny? Despite that, parts of the pillow episode are one of the only episodes I genuinely enjoy, because it's just completely absurdist, and feels like it has absolutely nothing to do with the premise of the show, aside from the horny teenage boys link. If the entire show was as logical as this, it probably would have been way more entertaining, in a how weird can we make this kind of way. Like on the same level of how South Park have done entire episodes about people eating with their butts and pooping from their mouths, kind of absurd. But the problem is they seem scared to commit to this weirdness. So when it shows up, it's completely jarring and doesn't show up again for ages until, oh, uh, now some scallops on a plate are talking. Okay, and as if that wasn't enough, there's a recurring character who is the ghost of American composer Duke Ellington. Randomly in the first episode, the dad character says that Ellington died in their house. The sounds of Duke Ellington, a, a great African-American American. Andrew, did you know that Duke Ellington died in this house? So for some reason, the kids keep going into the attic and asking him for advice. Duke, I wanted your advice and I guess I still do. So as well as the weirdness of the hormone monster, it's also established that ghosts are also a normal thing for this world? Like, this ghost basically fills the same role as the hormone monster, but for Nick instead of Andrew. Why didn't they just give Nick his own hormone monster? One of the most telling signs of how little the team cared about this making any sense is how the kids who are supposed to be 13 mostly sound like fully grown adults. Okay, can we be excused? You have a really big mouth. Thank you, I think? Andrew is kind of okay because he's developing a bit faster and that's part of the story. And his voice is suitably pathetic for his character. So, I know your parents aren't going to be home, but uh... But Nick sounds like a 30 year old man. Well, you're clearly too busy for me. Nick is supposed to be the one who's developing slowly. And he's tiny. That's a big part of the show that he's underdeveloped. Did you shave? Is that ornamental? The boy just hasn't hit puberty yet. Is this appropriate? So why on earth did they choose to use this voice for? Him. I think there's a reason that every single one of the kids in South Park has a high-pitched baby voice. I'm sorry, Cartman. Because it sells you on the fact that they actually are children. Imagine if Eric Cartman just spoke like Trey Parker's normal talking voice. That would come across as pretty lazy, wouldn't it? The character called Missy is the only one who actually sounds her age. Wow, see, wow, forbidden lovers? But the only child character performance who is fitting and suitable stands out as being weird because they just didn't bother to do it with anyone else. And that's why we need equal pay. My like, dad says, you don't sound you like 13 year old. You Everything in the gay community is a thing. You also, don't sound like a 13 year old. Bye. What? And on top of this, it doesn't help that so much of the dialogue isn't even attempting to make them sound like children. They're all just tiny adults. Are you the patriarchy? Wow, yeah, a 13 year old would say that one. You're starting to see why I don't like this show now. None of this kind of thing should even cross my mind because you're supposed to sell me on your show. You're supposed to make this universe believable in its own way. I'm not even supposed to think about this kind of thing. I never even thought something like this could be such a huge problem. But Big Mouth has invented for me a new warning sign for bad writing and bad world building. And don't just say, oh, because it's a cartoon, it doesn't matter. Well, if every other animated show that I like can do it, why would Big Mouth get a pass? It's just confusing to me. And just because it's animated doesn't mean it should be held to a different standard. And all of that is really annoying. And that's without even mentioning the... Big. Ugly. Mouth.
I cannot believe I have gone this long without talking about how unbelievably bad the character design is. You look great as always, you post-racial power couple. No one looks great, they all look like horrible creatures, don't they, Max? Every frame somehow finds a new way to make me feel uncomfortable because of how hideous the design of the characters are. I think it's all to do with their creepy gem-like eyes and overly large foreheads. They're just not pleasing to look at. They look horrible. I found some rough animatics on YouTube, and without the gem eyes and scaling down the foreheads, the style actually looks okay. But the final look of the show is this clinical, flat and lifeless look. There's a musical number in the latter half of the show which really highlights how horrible it looks. It's like corpses are singing at you. As well as the overall unattractive look of the show, the actual animation is most comparable to Family Guy, and that's not a good thing, visually. This stiff, pivot style of animation can only really work for me when either the writing is brilliant or you're creative visually, or both. This isn't quite the level of the nutshack or anything, but they never use the animation for visual humour apart from shock value, and the hormone monster being funny and random. South Park has shitty simplistic animation, but they've managed to make it part of the charm of the show. Every time the animators break the usual two-dimensional angle, it's visually very funny. The only time I noticed something visually funny in Big Mouth were the various shot reverse shots where the main character's lips are so ungodly swollen that you could actually see them poking out from his fat head even when the cameras behind him, and that's more me laughing at the show instead of laughing with it. Speaking of... Part of the appeal of Big Mouth is the vulgar humour. It's what all the critics seem to like about it. It's revolutionary that a cartoon does something edgy and over the top with children as the main characters. I've never seen such a unique and fresh idea before. The way this show is written like, living with a willy for half the time, then Nick Kroll funny voice stand-up for the other half, gives this show a really weird comedic tone. If you're aiming for a slightly younger audience of people who are currently going through puberty, why is Duke Ellington's ghost a character? I didn't even know who he was, and I'm 10 years older than the kids in this show. Like, he died in the 70s. It's nearly half a century ago. Yeah, I'm sure Duke Ellington is what's all the rage with 13-year-olds at the moment. There are so many out-of-touch jokes that only adults would understand that only reinforce my point about the show having no idea who it wants to appeal to. In one episode, they have two cutaway gags. Two, that simply won't make any sense unless you know what Seinfeld is. Seinfeld ended two decades ago, nearly double the age of your main characters. So why are you referencing it in your Netflix show about puberty? What a strange decision. And for every joke that does work, I just think to myself, yeah, that would be funny. If South Park didn't already do this years ago in a much funnier and smarter way, I keep comparing Big Mouth to South Park because it just kept reminding me of how much better that show has dealt with all of these themes and ideas already. There's not one thing Big Mouth does that any other animated show hasn't already achieved. The Simpsons, Family Guy, South Park and Rick and Morty all have kid characters, and they all have it beat in every way possible. The pacing of the humour also drives me nuts. Everything's too quick. They never let anything sit and fully indulge in the comedy. Timing is so important when it comes to comedy, but when you're taking so little time to give things breathing room, it becomes a little overwhelming. It's hard to describe, but a lot of the time the show just feels off, just wrong, like a painting that isn't level. Something about it just isn't right. And then of course there's the constant, incessant breaking of the fourth wall. God, it drives me crazy. <laughs> Monster energy brings out the monster in you. What am I gonna do with that Netflix? <clears throat> Big mouth. That's the show. That's the show. There you. And you're home on the elliptical watching this. I see you. Why even bother writing jokes when you can just be self-referential and break the fourth wall for no reason? Isn't it funny that you guys are watching a YouTube video right now? Isn't it hilarious that I'm telling you that you're watching a YouTube video right now? God, this is so meta. This is cutting edge. We're breaking new ground with this one. Multiple characters directly address the audience for funny, funny jokes such as, lol, I, I bet you're a lol binge watching this because it's on Netflix, lol. Am I right, lol? You're binge watching it, right? There was this one joke that really annoyed me where they had the gall to take a jab at The Office. Another show that hasn't been on for years, saying that the interview-like structure is a crutch. So what, this is gonna be on The Office and Modern Family or, or what? You know. Boy, these straight-to-camera testimonials are great for narrative structure. They're a crutch, but they cut right to the chase. They really help with story. 
how is it a crutch? It's just part of the format and structure of that show. I'll tell you what a crutch is. A crutch is constantly breaking the fourth wall all the time, you damn hacks. You can be self-aware and self-referential without having your characters grind everything to a halt and direct the camera like they're Ferris Bueller. It comes across as so lazy to me. The last thing I want to touch on is the decision to include musical numbers all the time. Again, much like South Park or even Family Guy sometimes, out of nowhere the characters will often burst into song about the subject of the episode. There's a song in the period episode which is a parody of Everybody Hurts by R.E.M. There's another one about being gay which is sung by someone who actually does quite a good impression of Freddie Mercury from Queen. North Carolina. I actually kind of like that one. That one's okay. But there's one at the end that's about life being a mess and that one totally highlights the lack of subtlety in the comedy. Never share your feelings or life will kick you in the face. Sometimes everything moves so fast you throw up all over the place. <laughs> Children grow up and abandon you to die broken and alone. <laughs> Instead of having a song where every character suddenly just says exactly what the themes of the show are, why not actually be, I don't know, clever without spelling out every single nuance and leaving me with something to think about? I'm genuinely curious to hear from people who like this show to tell me why they like it. All the critics say the same nonsense that doesn't mean anything, and I don't agree with any of it. Like, is this the first edgy animated comedy you've ever seen? You realize there's so much better than this out there, right? Big Mouth is a show that only appeals to children, or adults with the mind of children. I got nothing from this show. All the messages and themes are things every adult should already know, and the comedy is nothing more than tired and predictable, or already straight up been done before, in a form that isn't horrible to look at alongside characters who are actually likeable or funny. If you still think you might like Big Mouth, load up the first episode on Netflix and watch the very first scene. If you think it's funny and sharp and great, then chances are you're gonna love the entire thing. But if you're like me and it makes you feel weird and uncomfortable, not because of the subject matter, but because the pacing and visual style and characters and writing make you wanna be sick, you should probably just give it a miss and put on something that doesn't suck. Just watch Bojack Horseman instead. The first episode stinks, but after that it's great. If you're looking for an animated show that's all about life being a mess, that'd be a good one to start with. I'm fed up of staring at this ugly show now and I want to end the video. So now I'm going to end the video. Thanks for watching. Bye. What do you think of the hormone monstrous Arch? What? Stop licking the mic.